Uh, 2 Timothy, if you have your Bible, 2 Timothy chapter number 2, we began last week as we opened up a new, a new section on what we believe. And uh, the premise for this is I want to make sure, I want all of us to live the way the Bible tells us to live. And I hope that you don't have just a casual acquaintance with the Bible, but that the Bible is a dear friend to you in your life. All right, it ought to be something that you love and read and know. And think about this, when you have a dear friend, a couple of things happen about the, uh, with a dear friend, a close friend. You know, you have a, a close friend, uh, you can often finish their thoughts or their sentences, can you not? You can, with a glance, know what they're thinking. Hopefully, you're so close to the Lord and to what the Bible's not just a casual acquaintance, it's a dear friend. You know, no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Here's a verse we bounce off of right here. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Remember a couple of thoughts from last week before we pray and begin. Uh, remember this, that first of all, as we study, all right, as we apply ourselves to God's word, we're being approved not by our peers or by internal measure, but by God himself. He is the one that can look down and say, that is my child. I am pleased with, the, with their attitude and the diligence with God's word. It's not a comparison game. Well, I know more of the Bible than Brother Kemp does, so I must be a better Christian. I'm not saying that. I'm just pretending that that's the case, okay? Um, but it's not a comparison game. But we often play the comparison game. Hey, well, well, listen, I, I've read so much more Bible than them. Listen. God is the one who approves us to show thyself approved unto him. He is the one that knows our thoughts and intents of our heart. Remember a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, and I posed this thought last time. I wonder if, uh, or I'm afraid that some of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Having lived in the great country of the United States of America, speaking English, having never known a day without access to a Bible, the fact is we have access to multiple Bibles, do we not? Uh, many people have a church Bible and a home Bible and a soul winning Bible and a Bible on their cell phone and a Bible on their tablet. There's not a shortage for us of God's Word, is there? There is a time and there's a place where that's not the case, where people would, would give almost anything they had to just read a few pages from this book, but, but we don't have that issue. I wonder, I'm afraid we may stand before God, having had access to this book, to read it as much as we want. We can open it, and I can open it during the day and not fear someone coming in and, and throwing me in prison or taking my family or confiscating my house or my car because I have a Bible. I can openly read it. I can, I can sit down in the courthouse and read God's Word. I can go to McDonald's and open God's Word without any fear that someone's going to report me to the secret police, right? And yet, one day when we stand before God and, and we give an account for things done in the body, what account can we give for having that much access to God's Word? I wonder if, I'm afraid if the question is, well, you only spent that much time? You gave me five minutes a morning? Uh, five minutes? Hey, that's, well, 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 Lord, you didn't know how busy I was. I had a lot of texts come in. I, I had to get to work. I worked a lot of hours to, to provide for my family. I'm supposed to provide for my family. Oh, providing for your family. Okay. And, and they needed two or three vehicles and a, you know, but only five minutes right here? Study to show thy self approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And that last phrase, my, probably my favorite part of this verse, rightly dividing the word of truth. I want to make sure and, and I pray that we do the, a good job of handling God's word so that we interpret it correctly. So we don't misinterpret God's word. I don't want to miss what God has for us. And sometimes, unfortunately, people take God's word and maybe they're a little bit loosey-goosey with it. Seems like one verse that everyone who's even not a Christian knows is this. And they quote it this way. The Bible says, don't judge. And at that point, you're supposed to stop speaking, right? Fall back in, in utter shock because you've now been smitten by this, this verse that this unsafe person or, or, has now given you and not realizing that's not exactly what the Bible says or even what it really means in, in Matthew. All right, And so I want to make sure that we rightly divide the word of truth. So we, we correctly interpret and apply it. See, so some things are, are, are meant uh, uh, during that time that they would maybe would apply in a certain segment. Other times, other, there's truths that are universal, other, other, other things. And so we want to interpret it correctly and understand what is the Bible teaching us and telling us. 
And so we want to divide the, divide the word of truth. Let's pray and ask the Lord's help and the lesson tonight. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word and that you give to us. We can so, uh, Lord, aptly just open and read and study. Lord, give me the wisdom and the help tonight. Lord, help me to communicate the truths as clearly as I can. Lord, help us to be good soil and listen. And would your spirit speak to us? In Jesus' name, amen. I brought last week, of course, Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And then I posed these uh, last week, these mistakes that we are sometimes guilty of. Sometimes guilty of. The first mistake I mentioned was this, that we sometimes mistake a superficial knowledge of the Bible for true biblical wisdom. Now, we, we sometimes think, well, because I know this verse, now I know God's truth. And just because we can quote a verse does not mean that we're applying God's wisdom and true biblical wisdom. Remember that knowledge is knowing the Bible. And I love the fact that our young people memorize verses. I hope you're memorizing verses. Hope you're hiding God's word in your heart. But it's not enough just to know a verse and be ye kind one to another. We can quote that all day, right? If you're still a jerk... To your coworker, you're not applying true biblical wisdom. You just have a superficial knowledge of this, all right? So we don't want to confuse the knowledge with true biblical wisdom. There's knowledge, understanding, and then wisdom, which is living the Bible. The second mistake we mentioned is sometimes we're tempted to be scholars of scholars rather than scholars of Scripture, all right? And perhaps we hear a, a message from someone or we read a good blog on the internet we're like ah oh, this is why and those can be helpful i try to be helpful when i preach and the preachers we have in to be helpful but i want us and my desire for myself is to be a scholar of this book right here i mentioned this last week but uh this summer dealing with some of the alcohol issue and that's a topic that lord willing will address in a few weeks along with music some other things like that and one of the pastors that I was speaking to uh, knew that I had done a study on alcohol. I have a 27 page, uh, about 26 and a half, 27 pages on Google documents uh, on my computer of a study on alcohol and what the scripture says about alcohol, along with some interpretation of that and some other data as well. And this particular pastor asked, he goes, can I have a copy of that? And I said, yes, as soon as you send me yours. When you know it, I've not gotten his yet. Scholar of a scholar or a scholar of scripture. And unfortunately, those same people will have very dogmatic views of what scripture says. But maybe not the study. All right? And sometimes you won't know everything up front, right? We have to study, but, but I want us to be, I don't want to be tempted to be a scholar of a scholar, but scholar of scripture. And the third mistake, we sometimes give more credence to our feelings than to God's word. I could stay here for a while. I won't for sake of time, but let me just mention it again that, that if I had a dollar uh, for this phrase, well, I know what the Bible says, but, but I think, but I feel, fill in the blank. Always another biblical truth, right? <laughs> Not usually. Usually it's an anti-statement to what they believe the Bible says to be true. I know I'm supposed to, to love my wife, but you don't know what she's really like. God does. And I imagine when the, the Holy Spirit inspired those words that he probably knew people's personalities as well. He probably understood that better than you do and I do. And so sometimes we give more credence to our feelings than to the, the clear word of God. And then one more uh, a mistake uh, that we sometimes confuse decisions and actions of things that could be sin with things that are sin. All right, I want to just talk about this a little bit to explain it, just make sure I, I explain this one clearly. There are some things in the Scripture that are always sinful. Always. For instance, murder. No way around it. Okay? Fornication. No way around it. Immoral activity. Adultery. Always sin. Devil worship. Always sin. Okay? Those things cannot be packaged differently. You know, well, 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 fornication, it's not wrong in this particular circumstance. No, no, it's always sinful. All right, the Bible says these things are sinful, and there's many more, but I just, for a few, for sake of argument, for a few. There are other things that are not 
necessarily sinful, but could be sinful. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. All right, and so there are some things that the Holy Spirit and God made me for me and I not, might not be able to do, and it would be sinful for me because I would violate what God has spoken to me about. The issue comes when I then begin to try to impose that particular conviction of the Holy Spirit on everyone else. You sometimes see this with music. You'll see in a church where a particular song would not be welcome in a church. And there is, we can all agree that there is certain music that is not welcome in church. All right, and we'll talk when we get to that point. There's definitely certain music that has no place in the house of God and the worship of God. But there's other music that is not necessarily sinful for every single person. I mentioned last week I was in Puerto Rico for my grandfather's funeral. And their style of music and worship is different, believe it or not, than Saginaw, Michigan. Who knew? And I would dare say if I brought some of that music to Saginaw, that would not be appropriate, nor helpful, nor right for us. But that music is not necessarily sinful, just because it's not good for us, not right for us. We have to be careful about that. I'll give you another one. Beards. Some of you don't like my beard. Facial hair, call what you want. My wife likes it. She calls it the Puerto Rican sizzle. <laughs> Pastor, I don't know what that means. Must be like that music. No. But there are, there are, there are some men who, who don't believe it's right. Not a preference, but say, you know what? You cannot, you cannot have facial hair. Because of where they're saved from or, or any their circumstances. That's fine. I'm not arguing with them. But I don't think from Scripture that you can say having a beard is sinful for everybody. It can be. Part of it can be motivation. You can't tell me. But, but there are some things. I, I'll put one more on there. Talk radio. Talk radio. All right. Now, some of you have no business listening to, to political talk radio. It does nothing for your spirit. It, it, it drags you down. All right. And, and it is for you distracting and sinful does that mean it's sinful for everybody so you see how sometimes we confuse the decisions and actions you're like well pastor Howell that seems like it's tough well maybe we have to get in God's word and study and pray and seek God's face yeah. all right maybe we have to start living like we say we live all right we, we don't want to confuse those decisions and actions of things that could be sin all right don't confuse those those though it can still be sinful with things that are clearly always sinful all right and then sometimes we fail to to walk with eternal perspective and view so we begin tonight some other some other truths for us as we continue on i want you to first notice this that the bible teaches that i am to follow it now they, they probably have a screen to put back up there and uh, i found out i didn't realize during the service some of you were cracking up last week when i talked about how i don't put things on top of my bible anybody notice this and then on the screen there was a bible with a notepad and pen on it right and I did say when I was preaching that this was what I did. Did I not? The perfect example. All right, so if they find that, I'm sure they'll put that back up for us. Uh, but the Bible teaches that I am to follow it. I'll give you some verses here, but we don't know what the Bible says, so we don't do what the Bible says. All right, we have to know the Bible to do the Bible. Okay, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Uh, interesting word, it starts with trust. Trust in the Lord. I looked it up. What do you think it means? Trust. Look at you Bible scholars out there. The word trust means trust. Or they gave another word to help define it. You'll love this. Trustworthy. Don't you love it when they use a word to define a word? <laughs> You could read that and you can know exactly what that means. What, 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 what that means. And the Bible says you can trust in God. He is trustworthy. He's dependable with all thine heart. And don't lean on your own understanding. Well, if I'm supposed to trust the Lord and not lean on my understanding, that removes the factor of me just figuring out what God is because that would be my understanding. 
So there must be another standard, trust in the Lord, and I would propose right here what the book of Proverbs teaches us that that is wisdom, all right, God's word. So the Bible teaches me that I am to follow it. You see, I, I can trust the, the Bible more than any car. You ever have a car that's undependable? Ah, there's the picture. They got it up there. There it is. It's obviously not from my office or Pastor Let's office, neither one of our offices. No, sir. And so probably Pastor Dylan's office. That's probably his office. I'm really picking on him. Where are you, Pastor Dylan? I'm sure picking on you tonight, man. I, I feel badly about that. So, no, no, listen, I, when I'm shaking hands in back, all right, I'm going to be getting some of you, you people feel bad for me. You're like, you shouldn't pick on Pastor Dylan so much. And uh, I just figure if you're willing to wear pink socks, you can handle it. But, um, but you will. Just stop while you're behind, Pastor Dylan. Wow. Uh, but uh, uh, he's doing a great job, though. <laughs> he's a good guy. Uh, but the Bible's trustworthy. You ever had that car where you don't know if it's going to strand you somewhere? Right? You don't know if it's going to be trustworthy, if you can make it. I, I, we've been there, right? Young couple, we're like, oh, boy. So we asked Brother Turnbull, Brother Turnbull, will this car make it on this trip? Kind of trusting Brother Turnbull. And, of course, Brother Turnbull, he's a great guy. Good thing he likes me. Oh, yeah, Brother Howell, go to New Jersey. No problem at all. You know? <laughs> As I'm laughing, as he, he's laughing as I drive out, you know, down the road. But you want to have something trustworthy. The Bible is trustworthy. God is trustworthy. You can follow it. It'll never fail you. First Thessalonians 5, 21 through 23, Paul says this, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says you can follow the Bible, and you're now supposed to prove all things. That means to test, to examine, to scrutinize, and deem to be worthy or to be unworthy. So all things, as it pertains to all life, I'm supposed to now put to this, to this litmus test, to this test, and see if this thing in life, all thing, is worthy and deemed to be worthy. Once again, it implies that there is a standard, that there is something that I can go back to that brings some stability. This word was often used in Greek writings, in secular writings, not just the Bible, secular writings, when they talked about examining precious metals. They would go to a shop, or they'd go to a side, a man who was selling gold, and they would prove it. Though this man said this was gold, was it really gold? If it wasn't, you wouldn't pay for it. What's, in, what's intriguing to me as I studied this particular verse out in this word is that even then when in the secular writings they would know how to prove a piece of metal, that there would be a standard that everyone agreed upon. Gold is valuable. And everyone would agree what gold is and what gold isn't. They would know that this isn't gold. No matter what I say, no matter what I write on it, no matter what I color it, this isn't gold, right? I could not convince you that this was gold. I maybe could convince a child someone who is immature in their learning. Could I not? Could I say, oh, to a one and a half year old, this is real gold, right? But that's not the standard, is it? As we prove all things, we have a standard that sets the mark and says, this is true, this is trustworthy, this is right, and this is wrong. It's not up for debate. It's not up to our just our interpretation. Well, well, I think that's gold. Well, wonderful. I'm glad you do. But it ain't. I think that's good for my life. But it ain't. Prove all things. Hold fast. Guard it. That which is good. Don't you wish tin foil was silver? I'd be a rich man. I'd sell silver all day long. But no matter how you package tin foil, no matter how you use it, no matter what you do with it, tin foil is not silver. 
And in our life, as we prove all things, there are things that are right, there are things that are wrong, and the Bible teaches that I can follow this standard. I can follow it. Another verse that's brought to our attention, Psalm 119, verse 105, where the Bible says, Thy word, speaking of God's word, just so there's a clarification, God's word, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Step by step, day by day, moment by moment, God's word lights my path. God's word lights my feet so I can walk correctly, so I can step correctly. We have a lot of animals at our house right now. You may have noticed that uh, in, a, in a skit video they have re referenced a pony. My wife has put in for a pony for us for the house. We have not gotten a pony yet and it's not because I don't love my wife. I love her dearly and uh, she's my favorite wife. All right, And uh, it's because right now we don't have room for a pony. And, uh, and someone was giving me a hard time the other day, Brother Sharky. They're like, why don't you give your wife a pony? Buy her a pony. They're, they're, they're giving me a hard time. And I'm like, really, what do I really tell my wife no on? Really, I mean, really, you know? Uh, here's the problem with the pony. She, she wants me to clear off about an acre and a half of, of solid trees for, for a pasture. And so I just haven't got to cut down all the trees yet. Once I cut down the trees, 2065... 20s, 2075, somewhere in there we'll get the pony, but, but, <laughs> but we have animals, we've got 16 chickens and a dog, and now two cats, and uh, you say, why'd you get the cats? Well, I had a, a mouse problem, and so we adopted some cats from an abandoned home in, in, in downtown Saginaw, and uh, these cats, so every night my wife, every, my wife goes out there to feed them, and she takes one of my flashlights with her, okay, you know I have like a little flashlight thing, and uh, Oh, I don't know why you're chuckling, Brother Bedore. I got flashlights all over the house in my car, in my office. And, I mean, prawn preacher, right? I got, I got lights everywhere. And she, last night, where's that flashlight, honey? Okay. Well, Doreen, there's lots of flashlights. Grab a different one. She takes that flashlight so that as she walks down this path, all right, she doesn't trip and fall. And every day we walk down this path of life. And unlike the path back to my pole barn, there are some major obstacles in our path. All right, we, f we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. There are obstacles in our path, sometimes in the form of, of situations and tests and trials, sometimes in the form of people, and sometimes some outside, but possibly even um, spirit-led um, or, or spiritual warfare going on in our path. And the Bible says that God's Word, God's Word I can follow it. It's a lamp to my feet. As pastor often talked about, they would often tie the little lamp to their feet just so they could see enough for one step. Not enough like the flashlights we have now where I can shoot from here to kingdom come, but just enough to see the next step. And I and you need that in our life. We need God's word to follow it. It's a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Yet sometimes we're stumbling in darkness and we trip. What do we say? Oh, God, how'd you let this happen to me? Did you turn the light on? I, I gave you a flashlight. You can use it for your feet. Are you going to use it? It's lamp to my feet, light to my path. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 22 through 23. The Bible says this, When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp ah and a, and the law is light and the reproofs of instruction are the way of life proverbs 6 begins with a reference to the father and the mother and their instruction it's the same reference made in proverbs chapter 1 verse number 8 and i believe absolutely extends to scripture not just to parental guidance all right so if you're looking at proverbs 6 and see proverbs 1 you'll see that this extends not just to parental thoughts but to scripture and god's wisdom it's a lamp it's a light and the correction the reproof is the way of life now some would argue that this is this is just how life operates but that's not what the scripture is saying he's not saying this is the way life operates a way of life that's you know like that's the way life is but he's saying this is the path of life we see that in proverbs chapter 12 verse 28 and the way of the righteousness in the way of righteousness is life and the pathway thereof there is no death 
Uh, often in Proverbs, you will find a comparison that when someone follows righteousness and truth, there is life, and then death is the opposite end of that. When they turn around, and, and he's giving us the, the, the ends of these two lives. One ends up in blessing and in wonderful righteousness, and one in corruption and death. And Proverbs argues that throughout the book of Proverbs. Then in Luke chapter 1, we see again scripture where Jesus talks as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, in verse 79, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. You notice three different passages, the Bible compares itself to light. So you may laugh at my, uh, my, little, uh, um, uh, my, my little flashlight love, but maybe, just maybe, I'm just trying to get a biblical illustration in my life. Or maybe I just like flashlights. But the Bible itself says it's light to those that sit in darkness and to guide our feet in the way of peace. Do you not want peace in your life? In the way of calmness in your life? Do you not sometimes say, listen, I just need some peace. Sometimes our lives feel like utter chaos and, a, and a, just a mess of things. And the Bible says it'll give you, it'll guide your feet in the way of peace. You can follow the Bible. 1 Timothy, Paul says in 3, verse 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That, that as a Christian, we can be well-rounded, a complete individual. So the Bible, I think, clearly teaches that we are to follow it, not just as a suggestion, but as a way of life, as a way of peace, as a guide all right, as trust and a trustworthy source, the Bible is a thing that I can follow. But the Bible also teaches that it is the authority for my life. It's not just like someone saying, hey, hey, come and follow me. All right, though the Bible gives us that analogy, that illustration. I'll share some more verses. The Bible teaches that it is not only just something to follow, it is the authority for my life. I have some questions to think about, four of them here. First question is this, don't answer out loud, answer inside your head. Do I view the Bible as ancient or authoritative? Do I view the Bible as just ancient or authoritative? Second question, would I do something because the Bible says to do it? Would I do something because the Bible says to do it? I think we would all quickly argue, well, of course I would, right? We're Christians. We're on a Wednesday night. We're preaching to the choir, Pastor Howell. Of course, if the, if the Bible says it, of course I'm going to do it. Well, good. We'll just hold on. We'll get back to that question. Next question. Would I change something if the Bible teaches against it? If the Bible teaches against it, would I change something and then last question, would I act upon something if the Bible is clear? Let's talk about these questions real quick and then continue on. Do I view the Bible as ancient or authoritative? You say, well, why do you ask that question? Well, how many are aware of current news? There's some things that are going on in the world right now. Uh, do you know that the president is in impeachment hearings? Anybody know that? Come on, put him up there if you know that. The president, come on, put him up there if you know that. How many say, I had no clue that President Trump, that anything's going on in the Senate about impeachment. Anybody not know anything at all? All right, we got one person. Everybody else, most other people know something, right? How do you know that? Right, any, anybody live in Washington, D.C.? Anybody work in the Capitol? Or how many looked at another source for that? Another source, right? Maybe on your phone, maybe on TV, maybe even... Um, What's that thing uh, like a flip phone in the Smithsonian? Oh, a newspaper. Maybe a newspaper. That's what it was. <laughs> How many know about the fires raging in California right now? Right? Terrible fires out there. Evacuations. My, my, found my, so my family had to be evacuated over there. My brother lives out that, that direction. How do you know about the fires? You fly out there. You drive out there. Your family made family out there like I do. What did you read out from another source? Another source, right? Well, why do we know these things? Well, for some, it's because you want to know what's going on in the world. It's, it's interesting. It's current. I got to be in touch with what's happening. So do you view the Bible as ancient or authoritative? You see, if it's just an old book, well, why would I waste any time on it? 
The Bible is ancient, but it's not just ancient. All right, it is old, but it's stood the test of time. And I'm afraid we know sometimes more about what's happening in D.C. than we do B.C. Would I do something because the Bible says it? Yes, no. All right. I think most of us, if I had to raise a hands, I will not, would say yes. Well, do you tithe? All right, this is not a, a crazy Bible doctrine, right? Tithing, you can probably find it a few places. But that's not in your wheelhouse. Do you go soul winning? Uh, once again, not a, not a crazy truth that we're going we're gonna to dig from the, from the depths of Scripture. We can find it pretty quickly, right? Say, well, Pastor Howell, we had, you know, over 200 people go soul winning recently. We did. And there's over 200 people here tonight in church. So by my calculation, help me here, not everyone goes soul winning. So, so we can say, well, I'd do something because the Bible says it. Of course I would, Pastor. If the Bible says it, I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> well, then let's do it. Next question, would I change something if the Bible teaches against it? Well, what if you found out that the Bible is against your political view? Well, listen here, Pastor. Don't talk about politics from the pulpit. Or you're not allowed to. You're not allowed to lose your tax-exempt status if you do that. That's like that Bible verse, don't judge, okay? <laughs> All right, you know what the same concept of that. You know, don't, don't mess with that, all right? You know, because this is, uh, people go crazy, all right? I mean, you start talking about guns, and I am for guns, all right? On a personal level, I, I happen to have a, a few myself. But sometimes people have their view of gun, gun rights above Scripture. I heard one, someone, someone talk about how that if they're going to take the guns, they would shoot them if they came to the door to take the guns. Remember that thing about murder we talked about? Murder it is never right, always sinful. All right, last time I checked, gun ownership is not in the Bible. All right, now, I'm for it. Don't get me wrong. All right, some of you are getting all mad at me right now. <laughs> That's okay. But what if you found out the Bible is against your political view? Would you change it? Well, I don't see it that way. I feel sometimes that our feelings overrun the book. What if you understood that the Bible talked clearly about your attitude? Would you change it? Because sometimes it does, and sometimes we have stinking, rotten, horrible, no good attitudes that don't please Jesus. And you can say it when you're 2, and when you're 22, and 32, and 62, and 82. The Bible is clearly against it. Would you change it? And the last thing, would I act upon something if the Bible is clear? Do you return kindness for evil? You know, the Bible is clear on how to treat unkindness. It's clear. You don't have to read very long or very hard to find out what the Bible says about kindness. And that includes unkindness towards your family, towards your spouse, towards your children, towards your grandchildren. Well, they did them wrong. And you're returning wrong for wrong. Now, the Bible says... So the Bible teaches that it is the authority for my life. If you turn your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter number 1, 2 Peter chapter number 1. Second Peter chapter number 1, Peter gives us a concept that I think is applicable to, to how we live. In 2 Peter chapter 1, Verse number three, where Peter says, according as his divine power hath given unto us, or the next two words, all things. How many things? All things. If the Bible says all things, Bible scholars, does the Bible mean all things? Yes. All things that pertain to what? Unto life and to godliness. Life, the physical living, life living right in this world, godliness, spiritual living, living right before God. So everything I need to live right in this world and right before God in this world, life and godliness, all things are through the next phrase, through the knowledge of him that have called us to glory and virtue. So his divine power hath given unto all things, God's power, all things, to how to live 
in this world and live before God righteously in this world. And it's all through the knowledge of him, Jesus, because he's called us to glory and virtue. So my knowledge of God brings the knowledge of all things in life. All right, and when I have that knowledge, and the more knowledge I have, then I will live righteously with life and godliness in this world, whereby, verse 4, are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You see, the more knowledge of Jesus that I have equals more knowledge of how to live. That's what the verse says. The more knowledge of him I have, of Jesus that I have, is more knowledge on how to live. So if you don't know how to live in this world, if your life is an absolute wreck, I would encourage you to get back to the knowledge of Jesus. This is how you learn of Jesus Christ. And, and toss yourself in the book, immerse yourself in the book, and say, Jesus, I need to know you. I need to know how you think and what you love and what you hate. The knowledge of Jesus brings all things that pertain to life and to godliness. It is an authority in my life. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then, then and only then, after this book of the law does not depart out of your mouth, that this book of the law is meditated upon day and night, and that you've observed to do all that's in there, then, then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Observing and following the Bible, the authority to live biblically, not a casual head turning to God's word, not a, uh hmm, that's good. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's neat. But a guarding, that word observe, to keep, to hedge about. Someone even said it is hedged about with thorns, meaning it is a place of safety and protected area. I think the implication is that when I observe to do all things, that nothing strays or nothing causes me to stray from observing to do what this book says to do. Because it is now my authority in my life, then... I have the authority to live completely in full obedience. And then the Bible says, my way will be prosperous and I'll have good success. That does not mean that I'll be prosperous in, the just the, or in, a, in a financial sense. It is not the get-rich-quick scheme that I still get phone calls for almost every day. Listen, call me back. Do you want to make seven, eight thousand more dollars a month? Right? Go to this website. Oh, my goodness. It is not what it is. But I'm now prosperous in God's economy. In his view, standing before him, my way is now prosperous. The Bible is supposed to be my authority. The Bible is one I can follow. As we move on in the following weeks, we'll use that as our foundation. Some of those topics, there may be some questions. Like I mentioned before, you have a chance to, uh, to ask those questions not an open form setting. But I'd encourage us to go back right here to the book. And hopefully you're challenged in those things by the book. And if you come to a different or a same viewpoint, come to it because this book says so. And come with an open mind that says, that if the Bible says it, I'm going to do it. If it tells me to change, I'm going to change. If it tells me to stay, I'm going to stay. And, and I'll do what the Bible says. It's clear. But then we'll be, I believe, Christians who are rightly dividing the word of truth. Lord, I thank you for your word and thank you that you've given us such an opportunity to follow you and to know you. Lord, would you help us not to be casual about this book, haphazard, Lord, but to be students of the word. Lord, may we read it, heed it, Lord, love it. Lord, thank you. For here in the United States, in the English, having access to your word every day of our life. Lord, thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.